Welcome to Partial Differential Equations. During this lecture, I'll be looking at how you solve general first order equations um, by reducing it to a series of ODEs. We've done this already when it came to the quasi-linear case, and so what this, what's happening in this lecture is gen necessarily a generalization of what's already been done, um, just slightly more involved. So let's look at the general first order equation for z, which is considered to be a function of x and y. We can write that down, express that in term, simply in terms of a function of five variables, namely the independent variables x and y, the dependent variable z, which basically represents your solution surface, and the partial derivatives of z, namely ux, which we often denote p, and ui, that we denote by q. And for purposes of this discussion, we're going to assume that f has two continuous derivatives. The solution of f equals to zero um, can be reduced, as it was in the quasi-linear case, um, to solving ODEs for x, y, and z, which we did in the quasi-linear case. But in this general situation, we're going to have to add two more, namely what um, the derivatives are at each point. And to understand how this arises, let us look at what the f equals to zero defines. In fact, it defines a relationship between the coordinates at a specific point, namely x, y, and z, and the normal to the surface at that point, which we can parameterize by p, q, minus 1. Remember, our surface can be described as z minus u of x, comma y, and therefore, the derivative of respect to x is simply ux. Um, the derivative of respect to y, which we denote by p. The derivative of y is simply uy, which we denote by q. And then since it is z, uh, uxy minus z, we have minus 1 in there. Okay. And now let's specialize the discussion to a particular point, um, namely x0, y0, and z0 and then on the integral surface. And then what we can do is we can observe that this point, the surface has a tangent plane at that point, namely the plane that if you put it down, it just touches the surface at that point. And because we know the point and we know the normal to the plane, it is possible to write down the general equation for this tangent plane. And here it is. And you can simply verify that the normal to this plane is exactly n, and that, in fact, um, p equals to 0 lies on this plane. And this now allows us to make an interpretation of what the first order equation actually specifies. Okay, so this tangent plane basically has two parameters, namely the components of the normal ux and uy, which we've denoted by p and q. And what the first order equation does is at each specific point, it can be viewed as implicitly defining P in terms of Q. In other words, if we know um, what Q is, we immediately know what P is. And as a result, the following geometric picture arises. Right At each point P0, we can have a whole possible planes that are tangent to the surface that's been depicted over here, a couple of them. For example, it can be that plane, or it can be that plane, or it can be that other plane. But there's only one parameter that, def that labels these various planes. In other words, if we pick Q, then P's value is fixed. Okay, So you basically have a one-parameter family of planes that go through P0, and what they therefore do is they sweep out a cone um, at the vertex P0, and it is simply the differential equation that then parameterizes which cone it sweeps out. And this cone has a name, we call it the Monger cone. So what f equals to zero therefore does is we've just discussed the thing at a specific point, um, but this is true for every single point, and therefore it basically defines a field of cones at each point um, that lie on the integral surface z equals to u of x and y. Um, and if you therefore want to construct a valid surface, you simply have to string these cones together. In other words, you have to make a surface that you start at a specific point, 
you move along one of these cones to a new point, at that point you're going to have a next possible cone, then you're going to move along one of the directions on that cone to the next point and so forth, and then you can actually go about this, this, um, constructing the integral surface. So if at each of its points P0, the integral surface touches the Monga cone, then in fact you have a valid solution to the first order equation. Okay, so let's just sketch this a little bit more completely. Here again is this idea, you begin at a specific point, the differential equation gives you the a number of directions that you can leave that point, in other words the Monga cone. You pick one of the directions, you move along the cone to a new point over there, you then have a new cone that's defined by the differential equation at that specific point. You satisfy the differential equation as long as that cone remains, uh, A, one of the um, planes remain tangent, so you can move along any direction you choose on the cone to a new point, and, um, and the, so forth and so forth. So you basically pick a, pick a, pick a spot, pick a direction on the cone, move to the new spot, calculate new cone, pick a direction on the cone, um, move to the new spot, and that's the means that you can solve, uh, start constructing a surface that obeys your um, first order differential equation in the full general form. Okay, so basically putting into words, each possible tangent plane touches the cone along a certain generator, that's basically the direction you're picking, and this generator is what defines the characteristic direction. Okay, so the idea characteristic direction we've already come across when we were dealing with quasi-linear equations, and this idea of picking generators along a specific cone is simply just a generalization of that. Um, in the special case that we've already dealt with, namely the quasi-linear case, the problem is easier because then we have the situation where the cone degenerates into a line that just had a direction A, B, C. Okay. So we've basically generalized this idea of a characteristic direction that you can read off from the differential equation directly to this idea of start at a point, pick a direction that's restricted to be along the cone, move to the next point, and there you build up your characteristic direction in that way. So it's a generalization of this quasi-linear case that we've already encountered. Now before I go on, I'm going to make a little bit of an aside um, discussion. Um, so let's say we want to express an envelope um, of a family of surfaces, and we're going to call that S lambda. And the way we want to do it is that this family on surfaces depends on the parameter lambda, and the way we can therefore do that is we can say, yeah, we have Z, and you can think of it, and it's equals to G, X, and Y, and the parameter lambda, and this parameter lambda is basically keeping track of where at each point which cone we chose. But what we're also going to do is we're going to make sure that Z doesn't depend on the parameter lambda, so we're going to have the condition that 0 equals to G, G, D lambda, because what lambda does is it doesn't change the properties of the surface, of the solution, all it does, it parameterizes the solution. So lambda is basically this hidden variable that you will use to keep track, effectively, which cone we're choosing. Okay, and this, this statement is general for any um, envelope of, um, of a family of surfaces S lambda. We're going to specialize in a bit. Okay, so the equations that then determine this curve um, through the family of surfaces um, is basic, we can basically go about deriving. The envelope is simply the union of these curves that passes through them. And to find a solution to that, let us simply say, call the lambda, oh, so let's simply call the, the lambda, the parameter, a function g of x and y. Because remember, we start at a point, we choose lambda, which tells us which curve we're going to, which direction we're going to go out on. But at the next point, we could choose a slightly different, we could choose a different direction and call it something else. 
but the fact is at each point x and y we're going to basically be choosing what lambda is. So it's very natural to write lambda as a small function g of x and y. And therefore we have that the surface we can describe as z equals to g of x, y and lambda. And we can describe the normal to the surface is simply um, uh, d, g dx plus the, the full derivative with respect to x like d, g d lambda times d lambda dx, which is just gx, plus dg dy, plus dg d, and this is now the derivative with respect to y, dg d lambda, but lambda depends on y, so you have times dg y, and then minus 1, because we've written the surface in the form of z, of g minus z, say, equals to 0. But remember, we had this condition that um, lambda does not change the properties of solution, only parameterizes, in other words, that g lambda is 0, and so these guys fall away, and we're left with that. So this looks very, very similar to the normal that we worked out on the previous slide and that we're going to use when we actually specialize to surfaces um, for our specific PDE. So this statement is general for any envelope um, of a family of surfaces that depend on a parameter. And what we'll do now to derive the equations that describe um, our characteristic direction is we're simply going to specialize this. Okay, so to write this in terms of the differential form um, for the curve gamma lambda, we're simply going to have that dz is equals to dg dx dx plus dg dy dy, because we know surf, um, z is simply a surface of, um, simply a, a function of um, x and y. And we're also going to have this expression that the, the differential version that the um, actual surface doesn't change with the parameterization. So we take the derivative of lambda and therefore z doesn't change with lambda and then this is just taking the derivative. So now what we're going to do is specialize to the, on, the family of surfaces or the envelope of surfaces that describe our solution to um, the PDE. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose p as the parameter in other words, p becomes lambda, and we're going to um, view q as being implicitly defined by this equation. In other words, you can solve this equation to find q equals to some function of x, y, z, and p. Okay, so, and if we specialize to a specific point, we're simply going to be able to do that at every single point. And now what we're going to do is we can write down the equations for this characteristic direction with a specialization choice of parameter um, by specializing the above equations. So in the above equations, we're now going to have z, instead of we have the big G, is simply going to be u of x and y. And then for um, dz is going to be du dx, um, which is just p plus du dy times dy, which is just q. And the second equation, what we're going to get is we can just effectively take this one's derivative with respect to p. Okay, and what we then get is here, this, is, this corresponds to g lambda x, so it's just going to be 1, because we just take d dp of this guy, and the second one is simply going to be dq dp because we're taking the derivative of ux with respect to p. So those now are the two equations. One more equation that we have that comes simply from taking the full derivative of f with respect to p and assuming that q is implicitly defined in terms of p. So what we then get is df dp plus remember q now depends on p as well, the f dq times dq dp. And so these three equations we can massage a bit, okay, to get the direct, um, to get the direction of the generator, and we're going to get that since dz, uh, dz is going to be p dx plus q dy, which is just the one that got inherited. But if you look at these last two, we can see that dq dp appears in both equations, 
And so what we can do is eliminate that and what we then obtain is dx over f of p is equals to dy over f of q and we can then put that equals to another parameter d dt. So this is very similar to the way we characterized our characteristic equations for the quasi-linear case um, and which we can then flip over and simply solve the x dt is equal to fp and dy dt is equal to fq. Okay, so now we're in position to at least describe our characteristic um, curves um, that belong to the integral surface S by a set of ODEs. Okay, and there they are. This is simply the x dt is equals to the derivative of f with respect to p. And remember, f is a function of x, y, z, p, and q. dy dt is simply the derivative of f with respect to q. And dz dt is, we simply get from this equation over here, divided by dt. So we have dz is equals to p times dx dt, which is simply fp, and q times dy dt, which is simply fq. Okay, and recall here that z lies on the integral surface and p and q are simply the derivatives ux and uy at that particular point. Now, remember for the quasi-linear equation, when we wrote out the whole equation, we had a times p plus b times, sorry, a times p plus b times q is equals to c. So we can simply combine that into one function and what we then always get is that df dp is equals to a, um, df dq would be equals to b, and p fp plus q fq will be equals to c. So in the quasi-linear case, which is a specialization of this general case, we have reduced exactly to the equations we were solving in lecture two which is convenient as well as necessary. The problem now is that look at the set of ODEs. We have five unknowns in the right hand side and so far we only have three equations for x, y and z. So we basically need two more equations to define how p and q change um, as we are moving along the characteristic curve. Because only then, once we've defined our P and Q change, will we have a complete set of ODEs in which everything is well defined. And to work that out, we can simply use the definition of P, right? Remember, P is equals to U of X. So the P dt is simply equals to dP dx times dx dt, in which, which is U X X dx dt, plus um, dp dy, which is just uxy, times dy dt. And what we can do further is go about and we can replace what we know about dx dt by the thing we've just arrived above. So dx dt is just f of p and dy dt is just f of q. Okay, but when we do that, we have still have these little nasties over here because we don't know what uxx is. That's the very surface we are trying to define and we don't know what uxy is. That's also the surface we're trying to define by building it up by, from a whole bunch of curves. And so what to get uxx and uxy, what we can do is we can differentiate this function that we know. So let us differentiate this function with respect to x bearing in mind that u or z is a function of x and p and q are also functions of x. So if we can take the complete derivative of this thing with respect to x, what we get is f of x plus the f of z, remember z is u, times, using the chain rule, how u changes with respect to x, plus the f dp times how p changes with respect to x, remember p is just ux, so it's uxx, plus f of q times how q changes with respect to x and because q is just u y how that changes with respect to x you can just express as u x y 
And what we now have, if you're very careful, you can recognize that this UXXFP plus UXYFQ that appears on this side also appears over here. But the great thing is it is equals to f of x, which we can compute by taking the derivative of f, plus f of z, f to respect to z, which we can also compute, times u of x. But u of x is simply p. So what we can then have is the pdt equals to minus fx minus p f um, derivative with respect to z. And everything on the right hand side we can compute. And um, so we're done. We have a differential equation for how p changes along this characteristic curve. And you can go through exactly the same argument for q as well. So you now have the qdt equals to minus fy minus qpz. And so these two equations, along with these three others that we are vaguely familiar with from the quasi-linear case, provide a complete system of ODEs that we can solve. And these ODEs describe not only the surface z, but the... Um, actual normal to the surface, how that involves in time as well. Right, so in summary, the characteristic equations for a general ODE, um, sorry, for general PDE of first order can all be derived from this relationship that describes the PDE, namely f of x, y, z, which is u, um, P, which is um, ux, and q, which is uy, equals to zero. And what happens is you get the characteristic equation, so you basically then get five ODEs, which we've just written down for x, y, z, p, and q, okay, um, that are given by the following, which then constitute the characteristic equations. And these ODEs are simply the x dx, the x dt equals to f derivative with respect to p, dy dt equals f derivative with respect to q, dz dt equals p times f derivative with respect to p plus q times f derivative with respect to q. Um, and then you have these other two that define how um, the normal vector changes with as you move along the characteristics. So you have pt equals to f x minus p f z, and qt equals to f with respect to y minus q f z. And this system forms a complete closed set of ODEs that you can then solve, and you are guaranteed as you move along these um, characteristic lines. Um, that you lie on the solution surface and that the solution surface, at least locally, can be built up by the set of characteristics. Okay, so this is an autonomous system, meaning it doesn't depend on time and it doesn't require any knowledge of the integral surface itself um, or its formulation. It only requires the knowledge of this function f that defines the, um, the ODE. Okay, another important factor is this function f that defines the ODE is true initially, but it must also be an integral of the system. In other words, it must remain true as you move along the characteristic um, uh, sort of curve. And what that means is um, that the FDT must be zero. Okay, it's basically going to be an integral of the system because it describes the system at every single point. In fact, it is the way we built up the system of equations and therefore it's necessary to verify that it doesn't change as you move along a particular curve. And so, so let's just quickly do that. We can work out the FDT using the chain rule. So we have the FDT, which is basically then the FDX times the XDT plus the FDY times the YDT, the FDZ times the ZDT the FTP times the PDT plus the FTQ times the QDT. And what you're now going to do is you're going to substitute every single derivative that you've computed here that describes the characteristic lines um, as you move from cone to cone. And so you can do it. If the XDT is simply F of P, um, the YDT is simply F of Q, 
and the ZDT is simply PFP plus QFQ and then you have the PDT substituted in over here and the QDT is substituted in over there and if you now look very very carefully you have every single term cancelling out so you have FX FP cancelling out with this guy over here FY FQ cancelling out with that guy over there and P, F, Z, F, P is going to cancel out over here. And that um, F, Z, Q, F, Q is simply going to cancel out over there. So we have that the F, D, T is equal to zero as anticipated. So what we've done in this slide is simply made statements on how you can build up the general properties of the solution to an ODE, much akin to what we did with a quasi-linear case. In other words, we worked out the characteristic equations that one has to solve to generate a series of curves that then can build up the surface, also as we did in the quasi-linear case. Um, and you also have the theorems that at least locally, the um, it's, it's onto in the sense that every solution surface can be constructed in this way and every congruence of characteristic curves construct the solution surface. Okay, so this basically concludes this little lecture. I will be looking at the Cauchy problem, in other words, how you pick a specific solution now that you know what the geometry of the solution actually is like. Thank you very much.